This presentation came about because I met Christian online. Christian is joining us today from France in the mountains in his cool looking control room. Uh, he will be giving the second half of the presentation. And what we thought we'd do is I'd speak first and then Christian, and then we'll do Q&A. If you have questions, Tyler Cottrell, the smartest guy at SI Acoustics, will be uh, monitoring the chat and saving the questions, interrupting me if there's something that seems urgent to answer right away, clarification, and the rest will do towards the end. This is our first SIA live presentation webinar. Could be our last. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, let's see how it goes. So far, it's it's we're we're pretty happy with the way things have been going. It's kind of a nice feeling. I'm really thankful that you all decided to take a few minutes and spend some time with us. Is that David Prince? David Prince, I know, previously of the Chicago area. Hey, David. All right. This talk was given for the first time in Nam. Uh, this last June, Christian flew over and we gave this presentation. And the idea was to show three or four ideas that have been driving some of our design work. A couple of those ideas uh, apply to live sound and uh, some of them apply to studio design. And since we work in both, I thought it was a good idea to speak on both. And the ways of thinking about things are not so different. Uh, we'll give it one more minute and then we'll get going at 4.05 here. Um, are we gonna upload this on YouTube? Someone just asked. Yes, I think we are. Well, we're going to edit it together and see how it goes. Put that on our list of things we hope to do. A long list. It's a long, long list. 405, let's get started. I'm going to spotlight this. Let's get started. So over the past 40 years, which I've been doing acoustical design, there have been evolving ideas about how to deal and address and design critical listening spaces. It's not just performance versus production, but there are traditional and non-traditional spaces. Concert halls, theaters, cinemas, production facilities, conference rooms, these are obviously sound critical spaces. Video conferencing centers are a new idea. Classrooms have become much more, car, uh, much more sound sensitive cars. And non-traditional spaces used as event broadcasting studios, such as bowling at lanes, caves, etc. The goal for uh, critical listening venues has evolved. All performance spaces are now webcasting spaces. It's just true. Most conference rooms are teleconferencing centers, and audience expectations for live sound quality, both acoustic and reproduced, have increased dramatically. It's kind of funny because audiences demand highly intelligible speech and impactful music in all venues, worship spaces, theaters, sports venues, cars, but then they go ahead and listen to low quality MP3 recordings and accept bitrate streaming services. It's just a nightmare. For the past 150 years, performance spaces were designed to acoustically support the performer and the in-house audience. Today, performance spaces are designed for the performer, the in-house audience, and the broadcast audience slash production team. And that's a big difference. I was trained by Russell Johnson and the idea of production was not something he really thought about at all. The design trends in response to these goals that we're gonna explore here are in music venues, the stage acoustics have become more microphone and production friendly. And two, in production control rooms, multiple design elements to control low frequencies have become increasingly important. This overlaps with small venue stages where low frequency control, particularly on stage, is also really important. This is just a quick one minute review. The pictures of the Appel Room at Jazz at Lincoln Center, a non-traditional room with a very large glass wall overlooking 59th Street, Columbus Circle. We all know reverberation time, tonal balance, which I think is incredibly important, the distribution of reflections, modes, resonances, ambient noise and spatial consistency are all audible characteristics of the rooms. What factors affect these characteristics? Source and receiver types and locations, size and cubic volume, shapes, materials, and construction techniques. What we try to do is decide What's going to make a room good? What are we looking for? And the first criteria is that we avoid the problems that are largely associated with both performance and production facilities, such as tonal imbalance. Is it boomy? Is it accurate? Two, the room serves its intended purposes, acoustically supporting the primary performance types. This is a picture in the back of the Meyerson Symphony Center. 
I love this triangle. I just, I think this is great. Acoustical designers must develop an understanding of their relationship between perception and architecture. For me, and I believe for most of you, the path between these is via acoustic measurement and prediction. If you start with what you're listening to and you look at the architecture you're surrounded your, yourself with, you can measure it. You can try and predict what it's going to do. You can uh, compare your predictions to your measurements. And these are three interrelated ideas. From the architect's point of view, one thing is often much more important than the others. We end up having to fight for what we think is important architectural elements in design. It's funny, no one person designs these rooms, right? There's a huge team of people involved. However, when you start looking at really successful designs, you'll see that one person's philosophy, room shaping, volume, distribution, monitoring, tends to dominate the design. And our goal is to come up with a room layout, material selection, construction details, construction oversight to help translate the client's goals into architectural elements. Um, obviously, there are many other people who do that as well. In an acoustically large room, reflections and reverberation dominate the response of the room. In this room, you can sort of see at the top of the room um, some diffusion hidden behind some pipes. Uh, the pipes are actually filled so they don't resonate. And we slanted the glass behind the stage backward. Uh, it was not inexpensive to do that, by the way. Um, and the idea is that there's enough diffusion to bring some life into the room and there are no direct reflections from the back wall. They go up into the ceiling where they're either diffused or um, uh, diffused or uh, absorbed with absorption above the diffusers. In acoustically smaller rooms, the modes uh, dominate the response of the room in the mid, low, and low frequency uh, range. This is a room uh, it, which is both the extension of a recording studio and a small performance space. It holds 54 people as a performance space. You can see lots of diffusion. There are some soffits on the side that act as bass traps. And the idea of this room is that it's part of a recording studio complex where they can do either live shows or use it as part of the studio. But in either case, because the dimensions are relatively small, the modal behavior dominates. Most of the people who are joined us today are well aware of what a mode is. Here's an axial mode, and you can see that these are resonant frequencies, and there are lots of ways. Um, axial modes, one pair of parallel surfaces. Tangential modes, two pairs of parallel surfaces. Oblique modes, three or more pairs of parallel surfaces. The idea is uh, that these modes are going to dominate your decay, and this happens below the Schroeder frequency, which can be approximated as 3C over D, where C is the speed of sound and D is the typical uh, dimension of the room, the smallest typical dimension. And so in acoustically large rooms, you're usually uh, your modes are well under 100 hertz. And for acoustically small rooms, they are often in the 200-300 hertz frequency where you start to get uh, modal distribution. You can see a typical room where your Schroeder cutoff frequency. And the interesting thing is this response curve applies to all rooms. The question is, where is this frequency? In large rooms, it tends to get lower and lower. And in smaller and smaller rooms, it gets higher. In production recording studio design, modal behavior becomes one of the dominant challenges. And in larger rooms, it only shows up really in under balcony spaces or orchestra pits and concert halls. This is an important distinction between large room and small room acoustics. Everyone knows there are only three things you can really do to sound, reflect it, absorb it, or scatter it, diffuse it. The, for, the absorption at low frequencies is getting easier, but can be large and costly. Um, there are lots of great diffusers these days, one dimensional, two dimensional, uh, across a wide range of frequency ranges. Moving on, the role of measurements becomes important. This is a personal topic with me. As many of you know, I spent a long time working on developing a measurement system. The goals were to help us understand what we hear, 
allows comparisons of different rooms, quantitative comparisons, allows you to verify performance and quality issues and quantify quote unquote issues. Is the room boomy? What frequencies? How wide is the resonance? How wide is the cancellation? It allows you to quantify audible objective characteristics of a room if possible and provide support for design choices. There are lots of types of acoustical measurements and metrics. There's, I could, this list could go on for days, but they fall into some classes and you can have different ways of calculating these and um, understanding that is a talk in its own. But suffice to say that the measurements we make now are psychoacoustically uh, balanced, meaning that instead of just giving you a number, the measurement is intended to provide something that correlates to what you hear. All right, let's get to the nitty gritty. How is design affected by measurements and evolving needs to design trends? In musical performance spaces, stages now include more diffusion in order to better accommodate microphones, i.e. production, and two, low frequency control of the stage acoustics and sound system dispersion is much more common to create better sounding stages and to better accommodate production. Basically, both live performance spaces and production facilities have been impacted by the need to make more accurate, better production. I'm gonna show four recent projects of ours um, and what, how, these trends have affected these projects. This is the F SF Jazz Center in San Francisco, founded by Randall Klein. It's a wonderful facility. I'm super proud of this. Um, this facility seats about 800 and change. Uh, it features an asymmetric balcony. You'll notice that there's no balcony on house right, but there is a balcony on house left and house rear. It has flexible seating in that the uh, seating on the floor is removable, and so you can have raked seating with some flat floor for a dance floor or a general admission uh, or uh, ticketed seating. The goals, the mandates were that it was a world-class space for audiences, performers, and broadcast production. So being designed in the last 15 years, this facility went into the design saying broadcast and production were a key part of our uh, design. The stage should support acoustical performances with both full monitors and minimal monitors. And our solution for that was adjustable acoustical treatment, two isolated performance spaces allowing simultaneous usage, so they had to be fully isolated, provide robust broadcast infrastructure, a restaurant, practice rooms, office, and lobby space, informal, open, and intimate feel. The acoustical design goals were tonally balanced and acoustically intimate rooms, rooms free from disturbing reflections, stages that are acoustically comfortable for musicians, both acoustically and electronically, uniform coverage for the seating area from the sound system, a quiet room, NC20 or less, isolation to allow simultaneous usage, and an acoustical design and sound system that maintains these goals, and of course, all on a relatively low budget. Here's another picture of the room. You can see that there's no balcony to the right and there is a balcony to the left and to the rear. The key acoustical elements, the asymmetrical balcony, the acoustical canopy above the stage is fully diffusive as we'll see in a second. Upstage wall treatment is adjustable uh, between acoustic, uh, I'm sorry, between diffusive and absorptive. Wall and ceiling treatments, quiet plenum-based HVAC system, isolation between the, the performance spaces and a sound system that allows natural sound and controls dispersion. Okay, here we go. Here's a picture of the room from up behind the stage. It's not really as steep as that. It looks a little steeper than it is. The balcony is asymmetric and shallow. There's only really two rows that are underneath the balcony and you really don't hear it until you get behind those rows. Those rows. The Ceiling that you see is an acoustically transparent uh, ceiling. It's wooden slats and open 
for squares in the middle to allow for lighting and other production needs. So the cubic volume of the room is larger than the visual volume that you see. In concert halls, traditional above stage is not diffusive, particularly when there's a symphonic performance and you want strong cross stage reflections, you know, to allow different parts of the orchestra to hear each other. It's often adjustable height and angle to scale the stage volume to the performance type and an architectural within a lighting in studios uh, the any kind of panel above the mixed position is typically absorptive. It's typically not adjustable. And again, it is a lighting element. This is uh, Birmingham Symphony Hall that was built for Simon Rattle, uh, designed by Russell Johnson when I was at Artec and uh, is a uh, coupled room design. And you can really see the uh, large surfaces that make up the canopy above the stage designed to provide very strong reflections cross stage uh, so that the orchestra can hear themselves. Another art tech room from Russell Johnson was the Meyerson Symphony Center, I actually moved to Dallas to help work on this at the end. And that canopy never flew that high ever again after this photo was taken. But uh, again, large flat surface. This is a recording truck that was built for the great recording engineer, Dave Hewitt. Um, if you get a chance to read his book, on the road. It's a really great memoir of doing amazing rock and roll work in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And this was my yin yang cloud. It's uh, several inches thick and it's very absorptive with a membrane absorbed, uh, absorber on top of it. Uh, provides low frequency uh, and high frequency absorption at the same time. This is a room at the Clive Davis program at NYU built for Jim Anderson and Noah Simon. Uh, and it has an acoustical cloud, which also has a mem had a membrane absorber built into it as well as high frequency absorption. This is a room at Tonal Park. Uh, this is in Tacoma Park, Maryland. And again, non-adjustable uh, acoustical ceiling cloud. The evolved role of an acoustical canopy in smaller concert venues, it's diffusive sometimes, but more often not adjustable, and it can be with or without lighting. And in studio control rooms, absorptive, and now often includes more diffusive elements, typically not adjustable, and uh, often includes lighting. In the SF Jazz Center, the canopy that you see, um, that canopy uh, is fully diffusive with it used uh, 1D diffusers rotated to provide two-dimensional diffusion. So uh, back when we designed this room 15 years ago, there weren't a lot of two-dimensional diffusers that went down in lowest frequency. So we took uh, the canopy frame and we added diffusive elements. And you can see this is looking down on a drawing where we had, um, these were two by twos. We ended up switching to two by fours, as you'll see in a second. There's me next to the canopy. And you can see from above the canopy here, the diffusive elements go in both directions. And there are high frequency elements inside of these lower frequency. So it's a two tiered diffusing system with a mid frequency, mid high frequency, and a high frequency elements. Um, there's a little bit of an open space here. There's an op absorptive spaces in the corners. Um, we tried to add a little bit of air. We didn't want all the sound being projected out, but the idea is that this canopy is fixed in location and I went the wrong way. And that's what it looks like from the side, covered in acoustically transparent fabric. The upstage wall, the upper portion, there's one row of seating behind, and then this is set back behind that. Includes both absorptive, reflective, and diffusive with a fabric cover. The Here you can see the dark material is the absorption, the light material, uh, I'm sorry, the dark material is the uh, diffusive strips that are staggered in plan. The upstage wall lower portion has a uh, adjustable acoustical treatment. It has a combo diffusion with 11 inch depth to get approximately, it says 300, but it's really 400 and some hertz and up. And then we have retractable banners that go in front of it. 
So if a loud band has got a loud drummer with loud monitors firing at the drummer, they can drop the acoustical banners in front of the diffusion. Here you can see uh, the lower portion before the diffusers and retractable banners were installed. Here you can see the, the banners or uh, the diffusers are staggered in plan. These are flutter X strips or flutter free strips. I don't remember which one this was, but we staggered them about four or five inches in plan to really try to get down a little bit lower than the individual uh, QRD depth. And you can see the canopy and the materials going down onto the stage there. The acoustical treatment in all three of the locations shown here is hidden behind. Uh, in this case, it's um, wooden strips, uh, as slat wood, and we angled the sides so that sound could not get bounced back out. So they have miter cuts. And an interesting little side note, when you hang a canopy, uh, per, uh, when you hang a um, an array in San Francisco or in California, where you have earthquake codes, it has to be structurally tied off to a structurally permanent um, structure. The canopy was required to have extra steel to meet that and then a steel brace to hold the array. Another picture of the facility is a great place to hear music. I really love this room. Uh, side fills, you'll notice, are asymmetric. There are five on stage right and three on stage left because there's no balcony on stage left. This is one of my favorite bands, Tinarwin. Um, they're Korig people and they take uh, traditional African melodies uh, from their people and add lots of interesting electric guitars and traditional drums and chants and they're awesome. And here's an example of a rock and roll type show in this facility. Another picture of it, my friend Abraham. Here's the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra playing a visit with Wynton Marsalis and Ali Jackson. The sound system has Meyer Minas. They're very long arrays to get low frequency pattern control. The side fills are JM1s. The center cluster is a cardioid subwoofer array. The front and rear fills, extensive DSP for system control. The center array here is a cardioid subwoofer array, and I don't know if I can zoom in easily, but um, there are five boxes. Boxes two and four are facing the rear, one, three, and five are facing forward. We we put each of the five subwoofer cabinets on a different EQ and delay system. And here you can see the five cabinets. And if you just had the five cabinets firing with no delays and no polarity switch, it would be almost omnidirectional at 63 hertz, slightly elongated, but nothing particularly useful. At 80 hertz, again, you get that slight elongation, but not really much control. With three firing uh, forward and two firing rear, and you put delays on the rear firing, you can put a null right on the stage. This is a sectional diagram of the room done in the Meyer map program. You can see our microphone downstage center, a microphone in the audience, and a microphone in the uh, balcony. These are measurement positions. And what we try to do is make the sound as uniform as we could in the room uh, while putting the null on the stage so the musicians don't hear a bunch of low frequency sound in their uh, ears while they're playing. Here you can see the three forward, two rear firing. You'll notice the null and you can really see that well. By the way, if you look at the blue, it's about 38 dB below or more below zero, which is what you're getting here. So you're really getting a tremendous amount of cancellation at very low frequencies. You'll notice that the sound is going out almost horizontally. 
So there are two ways to improve this. One is physically tilt the array, which doesn't really work so well. It changes the null. The other th way to do it is to step an additional delay down. So the top box is at zero, and then you go one times the new delay, two times the due delay, three times, et cetera, and angle the system down, and you get a more uniform and more direct sounding low frequency to the audience and less sound where you don't need it. And there it is at 80 hertz and even 100 hertz, and that's what it looks like again under construction. So that's the SF Jazz Center. The Brooklyn Bowl Nashville is a really fun um, uh, fun gig. We worked with Richard Lenz, who's on this call, um, to come up with a custom version of his base mod diaphragmatic panels. Um, and we put them behind the 22 ounce synthetic velour curtain upstage. And the reason was our models showed that we were getting lots of low frequency energy in that 50 to 80 hertz region. And so uh, we put cardioid subwoofer arrays both under the stage and flown. And here's a base mod 4848. The 48 comes from the typical dimension, and these come in six, eight, or 10 inch deep, but we used them at, I believe they were six inch deep. And they're hidden from the audience. You can see our sound system is a very long uh, line array system. Again, this is a small venue, but we use the long line array to get low frequency control, and subwoofers are going to go both under the stage and they're at the top of the arrays as well. Um, here's the absorption characteristics. You'll notice that the base mod is really effective from 80 hertz up to 300 hertz, but it's really in that 80 to 160 range where you get so much of that woofiness sounding um, that creates tonal imbalance and sort of boominess. And you can see these are four by eight, so we made them in big panels and attached right to the wall. This is not the final curtain. The 22 ounce floor curtain was late and didn't make it to opening. Um, yes, these are bowling alleys. They're on separate isolated floors and you can't hear them on the stage. Um, this is what a show looks like uh, at Brooklyn Bowl Nashville. And you can see that it's got people up on the balconies on a couple of levels and a uh, really fun place to hear a show. The St. Louis Jazz Bistro is a wonderful venue, diffusive canopy above the stage. And in this case, we used both 1D and two-dimensional diffusers with low frequency absorption hidden on the upstage wall. So we use the same acoustically transparent fabric in three sections for a canopy above the stage. The goal was to give a warm cross-stage communication. Um, this band is the Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra. Uh, this is Dan Nimmer and Carlos Enriquez, uh, Grammy Award winner Carlos Enriquez, uh, Ted Nash as well, and Wynton Marsalis. And the upper back wall has a number of base mod type uh, absorbers behind the fabric, and the wooden pieces are meant to provide some reflection, some scattering, uh, and a lot of diffusion up above. There's a beryllium driver-based sound system there. Here you can see inside of a canopy. This is a good panel, G-U-D, kind of a funny name. They actually now are making a two-dimensional good panel. Maybe we'll have to go back and replace these uh, at some point, but they work really well in one-dimensional. And you can see the process of here, we're raising the arrays into location and dropping the diffusers. Gene Dobbs Bradford, the then CEO, has now moved on to uh, new things, but uh, without him, this room would never have been built. Uh, here are the guys who did the fabric. This was the opening night with Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra. Um, really great, fun venue, which works really well as a broadcast venue as well.
Our last example is E-Town. This is in Boulder, Colorado. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with E-Town, go to etown.org and listen. It's free, it's fun. Um, I'm proud to be a member of the E-Town community and have served on their board of directors. Um, Nick Forrester and, uh, and his wife, um, Helen, uh, built E-Town, a radio show that's on 800 or so stations and decided it was time to build an E-Town uh, physical home. So we built, they bought an old church and we turned it into 220 seat live uh, and broadcast venue with a uh, audio studio, audio and, video audio and video edit suites and offices. The use of large mid frequency diffusers on the rear wall impacts the stage as well. We kept the original stone wall. We put in new steel structure to help support it. Everything was falling down. This um, sound system is from Alcons. It's they have a hybrid ribbon, uh, high frequency driver that has tremendously good um, transient properties. We pulled the old plaster ceiling down and kept the framing because we liked the look of it. The, the floor had to be replaced on the main floor because it was found to be structurally unsound. So I took all of the wood that was used to support it and cut it into a mid-frequency diffuser, which is now the main part of our upper rear wall and some high-frequency diffusion behind the mix position. Excuse me. Just took a drink. A uh, little close up of the mix position here. Um, I think that's uh, enough of these examples, and we'll move on to a topic that I know many of you really um, have asked about and has been debated greatly, and that is control room design. So, the trend over the last few years is much. Uh, much more demand for low frequency accuracy in these rooms, particularly people working in immersive environments, people who are doing stereo mixes, getting the low end so that it translates from room to room and getting it right really matters more and more uh, for music and for film scores and for television scores and for everything else. We strongly believe that control room design must be a coherent uh, philosophy, meaning that you can't pick and choose. I'll use this and this and this. You have to come up with something that addresses all of the problems in a uh, coherent way. So we've come up with non-rectangular room shaping, low frequency absorbers, and asymmetric rear corners. The asymmetric rear corners kills people. I don't know why. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this. This is one of my favorite rooms and one of my favorite clients and one of my favorite mastering engineers, Dave Glasser. Dave is a wonderful person. He lives outside of Boulder, Colorado, and we've designed a number of rooms for him. The original air show mastering, which was a bunch of rooms, and then Dave decided to build one room up by his home in the mountains, and we got together uh, at the Telluride Music Festival, and I stayed up one night and started drawing and conceptualized this room. Um, basically, he was buying essentially a shed, and we were going to put a control room with a lobby and a little edit desk outside. And this was my idea in plan. You'll notice that there are complementary angles at the rear wall, and we'll talk about that more in a moment. The way this room works is we built a splayed wall, splayed ceiling, but we left a gap in the ceiling. And these uh, hatched areas are soffits. The rear wall has a large diffuser on it. And there's an open area uh, into a base trap where we had lots and lots and lots of low frequency absorption. And uh, the idea was that the room shaping would help control this, uh, the low frequencies, the asymmetric rear 
uh, corners help control the modal distribution. We'll talk about that again. And this base trap would act as a base trap. Here's what the room looked like. Uh, for those of you who know Dunleavy monitors and Duntech monitors, you can see uh, they're there. Uh, this is Dave's mastering room, a couple of Grammys there. Dave does amazing work. He's great with rock music and acoustic music. Um, we do uh, Flutter X panels on the sidewalls, again, staggered in plan. The soffits, there's no jip board in these soffits. They are 100% acoustical. There's a small cloud up top. This is looking at the opening to the base trap and where the soffits are going to go in the back. And you can really see the asymmetric rear walls here. Three different types of diffusers um, were used in the back wall. Uh, a studio style deeper, I think this is a nine inch deep diffuser. Some skylines that Dave found someplace and some... I don't know, can't remember what they call those. What do they call these guys, Tyler? Don't know, but it's a two-dimensional QRD, obviously. There you go. It's a <laughs> two-dimensional QRD. Um, you can see the surround speakers, and you can actually see how different the angle of the corners is here. Um, really changes the uh, sound, but really doesn't change the look of the room. And again, the opening to the bass trap isn't visible, but there it is. Airshow Mastering has a system room. It's at Tonal Park. And again, the same basic demands and comments for a mastering room. However, this facility uh, was a multi-room facility. These drawings look so simple until you try to actually draw one. Um, there are columns that you have to deal with. There are demising and existing walls that you can't change. There are so many issues to deal with. Uh, beams, for example. Um, we went through 20 some versions of this uh, before we got to this final one. You'll notice there are three main control rooms, mastering A in the upper left corner, the control room for the tracking room, the uh, live music recording, and then smaller mastering B, and there's also a small production room. If you look at the three rooms, you notice all three have asymmetric rear corners, all three have splayed walls, and all three have splayed ceilings. The production room does not, mainly because we didn't have room to fit it. Here's mastering A, and you can see the angles. You'll notice that there is a column that we had to encase there, and what we did was we created an acoustical column on the other side to make the room symmetric, and you can really see the asymmetry of the rear corners here. Another interesting thing is that the base trap here is asymmetric. The question was, what do we do with this uh, beam? If we started our ceiling high, we'd run into the beam and it would come into our room. If we started our ceiling low, we weren't sure uh, that we'd have enough height and we'd be giving up a lot of volume. So what we did was created a base trap that followed the line of the beam. These soffits, again, have no jip board. The yellow is jip. That's the isolation barrier of the room. The side walls sit on the isolated floor. The ceilings all sit on the isolated walls. And there's just a drop down under the beam. I hope someone's going ooh and ah. Do you think anyone's going ooh and ah? I don't know. Let us know in the comments. Yes. There's Tyler Cottrell sitting at Mastering Control Room. I think he's... Uh, on his computer doing something. I don't know what he's doing. Um, you can see the base trap is covered with the red fabric at the front of the room. It has some lighting, it has some duct work in it. And uh, these are Duntech monitors sitting on stone blocks. Um, really a great monitoring system. That column, this whole red area on the right side of your screen, the vertical portion is there just to mirror the uh, left side column that was there. and let us get more base trapping in the room. Here, that's Charlie Pilzer, the great Charlie Pilzer. I love Charlie Pilzer. Charlie's awesome. He's got an amazing ear. He's a super fun guy. And this particular diffuser used to be mine. It used to be in my control room in my office on Park Avenue. 
but Charlie decided he needed it more than I did. And you can really see the effect of the two different uh, angled corners here because they land on the back wall at different spots. So you have different amounts of flat surfaces and the acoustical soffit again. Another picture where you can really see how the asymmetric rear corners uh, are built. And we circled them for you. And this is a sort of a weird photo. I tried to show you both of them at the same time so you could see how radically different they are. Hey, Tyler, I just got to note there are people in the lobby. Oh. Okay. So let's talk about this control room design trend. Non rectangular room shaping is often as dismissed as unknown or not easily calculated, right? I think that's a crappy reason not to do it. I think that's a cop out. People go, well, it's hard to do. Well, yeah, it's hard to do, but that's why Christian's here, right? There are a bunch of people who really try to calculate these things, myself and lots of other people. And we feel we found reasonably good tools for calculating these things. Um, it's becoming very practical to do. There are lots of packages you can buy or rent or use. But the point is that this idea that because room rectangular rooms are easier to calculate is not a reason to use a rectangular room. Did we have any questions, Tyler? Sure, yeah, if we want to go through some Let's do a now. couple of Q&A questions real quick, and then we'll move on to Christian. Earlier on, I believe we were looking at um, slide over? SF Jazz. We had a comment from Jamie saying diffusion cannot affect the modes of a room. I guess that sparks the question, what are the good and bad uses for right. diffusion? Um, it's not that diffusion can't affect the modes of the room. It's just completely impractical. Um, a room the size of SF Jazz, the modal response, if, if you just take the Schroeder cutoff frequency and you say that a typical dimension is, let's say, I don't know, 60 feet, 80 feet, something like that, right? If you're going to say that a typical representative dimension of the room is 60 or 80 feet, 3 times C is 3,000, I mean, you're down pretty low. Once you get down into those lower frequencies, to make diffusion work at low frequencies, you'd have to be hugely deeply, you know, I mean, it'd have to be many, many feet deep. Um, the acoustician Jack Wrightson did a diffusive wall out of cinder block that was, I, I want to say it was three feet deep uh, at a facility in uh, at an amphitheater. Yeah, I don't think that we've ever tried to control modes with diffusion. What we try to do is control modes with room shaping, uh, splaying walls, splaying ceilings, and building large base traps. Um, we like using uh, panels like the base mod 4848, or we use similar panels in Bruce Botnick's One Eye Studio. Um, I think that there are lots of low frequency absorbing techniques, uh, building large base traps either uh, above the mix position or above the monitors like we did at Airshow, but we've never tried to control modes with diffusion. Question from John Herter yeah. was, what percentage open area did you use? I believe this was in reference for uh, SF Jazz. But what percentage open area did you use for the wood slats? Ah, the wood slats, that's a really good question. The area is about 50%. But when you miter them, it becomes a very interesting thing. If you have uh, some depth to your wooden slats, I wish, you know, I don't have a, we don't have a miter detail. Do we, do yeah. we can pull up? No. Nah. If you miter them, you get much less reflection out. The energy that gets into the slat goes into the, uh, treatment. So it becomes much more effective. It was a bit of a cost issue to get the mitered for the upstage wall, but it was worth it. So yeah, at least 50%. What else you got? Do you use poly, uh, this is Alexander Race. Um, do you use polyester fiber in your projects instead of glass wool? We've been using all sorts of materials. Uh, depends on the local codes and the uh, desire of the people. Um, it's funny, many years ago, a uh, famous recording engineer brought me to his room and he used the original cotton denim-based 
absorptive panels, which really didn't absorb at 100 hertz. And so he had this horrible modal room. It was like plus or minus 15 dB below like 125 hertz. It was, I was unusable actually. And it was when I looked at the specs for the material, I'm like, this is crap. Since then, of course, the materials and the people who make these products have improved them dramatically. So, um, yeah, we'll use whatever materials are at hand. Uh, we've used rock wool, different types of mineral wool, fiberglass, woven fiberglass, duct liner. Um, the polyester materials tend not to be as effective at low frequencies. They tend to be a little bit white, lighter weight. John Mansville had a uh, cavity fill material that was called spider that had longer strands that was really effective at low frequencies. And there are people who are selling like very expensive uh, laminated fiberglass panels like Versatune, which give you a uniform absorption coefficient. So we use whatever product is at hand that seems to do the job that we think is important. Um, we don't have any particular absorptive material we think is particularly better or worse than anything else depending on what we're trying to do. We have one more? Sure. Um, question from Dave Hatmaker. Yeah, hey, Dave. Um, I believe this was in reference to some of the soffits in the control rooms we were looking at. Yes. Uh, whether or not the uh, air openings are conventional, you know, HVAC diffusers, or are they custom manufacturers? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it depends. Uh, the question is, are the uh and air inlet air diffusers. yeah the the uh, yeah. the i was about to say the <laughs> hvac system diffusers it's so funny like the same word for diffuser <clears throat> right is acoustical diffusion and then air diffusion or air diffusers um we tend to like linear slots we've done custom linear openings like at the nyu the clive davis studio the air just drops into a plenum and then falls out of an opening in front of the mix position we've done that a few times we've taken uh plenum based linear diffusers and lined the plenums um we have We've done about everything you can do. Our goal typically are what we're as a standard studio, unless there's some special need for quiet um, beyond this, we go for NC15 as a design guideline to meet NC20 in the field. So we always give ourselves a safety factor. And given that we're almost always dealing with very slow air, um, we try to, um, use whatever diffusers rated for NC15 or less. Uh, and if something custom is needed, we just make it. Yeah, want to do one last one? Yeah, I think the last question actually segues nicely into yeah. questions portion. Okay. The question was from Kenji. Um, how do you determine the optimal shape for the corners in a non-rectangular design? Um, this is a really great question. How do we determine the optimal shape? The, I'll tell a quick story. Uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, I was very lucky, and the guys at Bell Labs let me use the anechoic chamber and their computers. And they had a big VAC 780 system, and I set up a finite element mesh and was doing uh, different angled corners to see how it affected the uh, low frequencies at the mix position. And I realized that it was taking a really long time to run uh, this program back then. I, I'm old. I'm just turned 60 and this was 40 years ago. And so computers weren't like today. Um, and the VAX is like, I think like your iPhone has more power than a VAX did back then. But I mean, we were running 14, 15 hours and they were getting upset because I'd start running in the afternoon. They'd come back in in the morning and my stuff would still be running. And they were like, all right, you know, let's figure out how to speed this up. And someone said, why don't you do one angle in one side and a different angle in another? And I came up with that idea and noticed that the responses we were getting uh, were more uniform, uh, particularly in that range from 65 hertz to 100 hertz, which is a critical range. So um, uh, that's how I did it. And then I realized that I was getting the best response with complementary angles, and the rest was just guesswork. I mean... Um, you have to have great clients like Dave Glasser, who I said, how about we try this cool idea? And he's like, 
how much of a pain is it going to be if it doesn't work to fix it? And I was like, it's going to be a big pain in the ass. And he's like, how strongly do you feel it's going to be worth it? And I was like, I think it's going to be worth it. And he said, let's go for it. And, you know, that's the kind of faith in you that you really dream about. And I will always be appreciative from Dave. And and uh, like I said, he's a great engineer and a really great person. So uh, I'm proud of that. And that is a great way because as recently as this last year, I met uh, Christian. Uh, I think we met through my Facebook chat group, the Acoustical Details and Discussion. Could you imagine a yeah. geekier name? Uh, so mm -hmm. what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing the screen, and I am going to hand this over to Christian to let him show you some of the techniques that he and I have been talking about for modeling these things. And uh, I feel lucky to uh, know him, and uh, we've had lots of fun and spent some time at NAM and uh, uh, I'm going to hand it over to him now. So direct from stinky cheese land, or as we call it, or France, as he calls it, uh, Christian Carvin. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, can uh, you can hear me well? Is, is that OK? Yeah, we just you, Christian. Yeah, all right. So uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and to share this webinar with you uh, guys. My name is Christian Carvin. I'm an acoustic consultant at Acoustic Design and Freelance. I am acoustic and sound system prediction measurement and optimization teacher at uh, Grimedif University in Lyon in France. And uh, I work also as a sound engineer, producer and mixer at All Production Studio uh, here yeah, at uh, saint andre en pont in France too. So in order to present the efficiency of splayed walls and asymmetrical rear corners uh, in the design of mixing and mastering room, we will study different room shape and compare some results in time and uh, in frequency. Why is playing walls? Because it has a potential improvement of spectral variance uh, compared to rectangular shape. We'll explain this quantity spectral variance a bit further in the description. The cons are the calculations involved and the construction complexity. Two calculation methods can be used to solve acoustic problem in complex shape geometries. The finite element method and boundary element methods are powerful numerical uh, techniques that use computational power to produce estimated results below the Schroeder frequency where room resonances dominate. Let's briefly describe the steps that constitute those methods. The geometry, first you have to define a geometry. Any geometry can be computed, polyhedral, uh, splay, splay the walls, concave sailing, the meshing. The meshing is an important part uh, in, the, in, the, in this work of prediction. It can be compared to um, uh, an analog to digital uh, conversion. The idea is to convert a continuous domain into a discrete sized volume or surfaces to be able to operate numerical calculation just as you would do with digital signal. The physics and the studies involved are pressure acoustic in time and in frequency, and eigenfrequency analysis. We'll also explain this term a bit later in the description. Those allows to predict the pressure and velocity at uh, any place in the room, and therefore they use sound pressure level distribution, frequency response at any point, uh, impedance, etc. The results will be presented by graph, 2D plot or 3D plots. So we have chosen to start with a very uh, simple shape in 2D, a square room of six by six meter. Here the source is placed at the center of the front wall and the mixing point is at three over eight the length of the room, which is uh, at uh, 2.25 meter from the front wall. As Sam said it before, the low one part is most the major challenges when you design a control room. That's why we'll focus on the frequency range between 20 Hertz and 125 Hertz. What retain our attention here is those peaks and dips. And to understand the origin of those peaks and dips, we've done an eigenfrequency analysis. What is an eigenfrequency? An eigenfrequency is a, a frequency at which a system is prone to vibrate. 
those are responsible for resonances and for standing wave. A standing wave is a wave that oscillates in time, but whose peak amplitude profile does not move in space. The eigen frequencies are directly linked to shape and dimension of the room. And what we see here is eigen modes. Eigen modes is the pressure distribution at those eigen frequencies. The red and uh, blue colors correspond to pressure and depressure, and the white lines correspond to null, while there is no sound. Particles are not moving back and forth. So here we can see for this uh, square-shaped room the different eigen uh, frequencies uh, at diff uh, yes different eigen frequencies. And now we have superimposed the uh, uh, two uh, two graphs. There are some black dots uh, on uh, on the low part of the graph. Those black dots represent the eigen frequencies, and as you can see, there it's directly linked with the uh, frequency response. So the frequency response, of course, it's obvious, but is linked with the room shape and dimensions. It's clear here with this graph. The spectral variance is a quantity that we are going to use to compare some results. It's uh, the difference between the maximum and minimum SPL value in a spe specific frequency range. Here, the spectral variance is uh, 67.7 dB between 20 Hertz and 125 Hertz. So it's a lot, of course, but as there is no acoustic treatment, we have to deal with this uh, order of magnitude. Now, if we uh, do a, a rectangular shape room of 6 by 7.62 meters, which is a ratio of 1.27, which is a good, good room ratio, 1.27, we think that uh, room ratio between length and width should be within uh, 1.15 to 1.45. So the improvement of the spectral variance is, compared to the square shaped room is 5.8 dB, which is uh, it's better. And you can see the improvement around 20 Hertz, between 60 Hertz and 80 Hertz and above 100 Hertz. There is this typical dip here for the square shape room around 50 Hertz uh, that uh, I wanted to mention here. Now, if we split the side walls, we have an improvement compared to the square shape room uh, of 10 dB. So uh, it's better. And now why uh, splayed walls give better results? Because axial mode causes the biggest nuisance and uh, axial mode occurs between parallel walls. There is like more motion of wave when uh, the walls are not parallel, and that's why there, there is uh, less nuisance. So we try to add some symmetrical rear corners. The improvement is still best than a square shape room, but less than just the display side walls. So we will not retain the shape, but when we are adding asymmetrical rear corners, the improvement is 13 dB, so uh, it's good, and we will retain this shape to uh, go uh, with the 3D, uh, 3D model. The thing which is very interesting with asymmetrical uh, rear corners is that it allows to uh, set the mixing point in a pressure or depressure zone, which is easier to uh, deal with and to control with acoustic treatment. You can see on the left, it's a symmetrical uh, room, symmetric room, and you can see that the mixing point for some eigen frequencies uh, in a null position. And it's very difficult to deal with the null with acoustic treatment. So that's why this concept is very, very interesting. Here at around 70 Hertz, you can see one more time that mixing point on the right, which is asymmetrical rear corner, is in the pressure zone, while on the left uh, with a symmetric shape, uh, the mixing point is on the null. And at 76 Hertz, one more time, and 104 hertz. So this line, this uh, uh, null, is deviate with the asymmetrical rear corners. Here is an animation, just quickly, to see that most of the time the mixing point is in pressure or depressure zone, while, while in symmetric uh, room shape it's not. All right, just uh, before we uh, say some conclusion with uh, 2D shapes, we wanted to uh, uh, mention that sound pressure distribution is source dependent. You have three pressure distributions on this slide at 71 Hertz. 
The one on the left is a uh, uh, Nagan mode. This means that uh, the excitation uh, of the room has been made, uh, the whole room has been excited. Uh, while on the center, the shape on the center, the room is excited with uh, a source which is located at the center front wall. And on the right, you can see that the source is placed on the left uh, front wall. So you can see that the pressure distribution is different in each case. And this is very important to notice this. And I'll explain you why a bit further. So one more time here, same thing at 87 hertz. You can see that the pressure distribution at the, are different. And here at 105 hertz and here at 122 hertz. So let's say, for example, you want to design pressure uh, based acoustic treatment uh, to uh, to solve some up, some problems at uh, uh, around 122 hertz. You do an eigen analysis and uh, you see the eigen mode on the left and you say, all right, I'm going to put this on the back, the center of the back wall. It could be a great idea, but if for some reason uh, you have some sources in the room that are not in the center, then for example, if you are at uh, uh, a source on the left front wall, you see that this could be maybe a bad idea because then your membrane, if it's a membrane absorber, will uh, vibrate. Uh, I don't know if you can see me clearly, but this will vibrate like this and excite a second harmonic uh, while in the first Hagen uh, mode analysis, you would have thought that it was a, um, the membrane would have uh, moved back and forth uh, at the first harmonic. So, in conclusion, we can say that 2D Eigen mode analysis of splayed walls combined with asymmetrical rear corners help to improve frequency response at mixed position in the critical 75 Hertz to 125 Hertz frequency range. So it's time to do some 3D modeling. We used Mastering Room A at Tonal Park, Tacoma Park, Maryland, which is a design of uh, CI Acoustics and Sam Berko. Acoustic treatment must be dedicated to singular issues of a room. Every case is singular. And specific requirements of the clients, constraints from the existing structure, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. You have a, lo a lot of things like sound devices or furniture. Each time it's a different case. So as a designer, we have to deal with this aspects and as an acoustic consultant uh, we have to propose a solution a singular solution that verify our acoustic criteria in terms of energy decay frequency response etc so here in that case the existing available space was a square shaped room of 7.62 meter by 7.62 meters with a cutout for a beam, which, uh, with, uh, which some uh, had a great idea to add some acoustic treatment for low frequencies. Uh, frequency response at mixing point, you can see it here, and you can see this typical dip at uh, just above 30 hertz. And this is a quantity that I use to do some diagnostic Eigen frequency lifetime, which allows to have information relative to the decay rate of energy at Eigen frequencies. This gives some uh, very good results. I use this quantity for now a few months, and I can see that there are some very good correlations with the measurements in the real rooms. Here, when we superimpose the two charts one more time, you can see some correlation between the frequency response and the Eigen frequency lifetime. So compared to what we see before, we have an information on about time on the right. And we can see that we are going to have some important issues at uh, around 20 hertz and uh, places where I've uh, made the, those uh, red circles. Uh, we tried to splay the sidewalls and it allows to bring very good improvement between 30 hertz and 50 hertz. And by adding the asymmetrical rear corners, this gives some improvement between 50 hertz and 105 hertz. And now it's time uh, to, um, to add some acoustic treatment. 
So, uh, as I said before, the acoustic treatment for low frequencies is uh, located at the sailing front. And by choosing the right porous material, we will probably have uh, an improvement around 23 hertz and above 80 hertz. And you can see here that it works. We reduce the peak at 23 hertz and above, and also we have an improvement above 100 hertz. Time for evaluate the next targets in time and in frequency. Here you can see that we will still want to reduce the peak uh, above uh, 23 hertz. We want also to reduce the resonances in time around 50 hertz, and we want to reduce the spectral variance uh, between 50 hertz and uh, 90 hertz, and also some uh, resonances in time around 90 hertz. And by choosing the right acoustic treatment using this kind of, of charts that represent isosurfaces, we can design membranes and locate, locate some membrane absorbers or pressure uh, based absorbers and also same kind of graphics for velocity to uh, use velocity based absorbers like porous material for example and by using the right acoustic treatment with the soffits and uh, the clouds and the walls the improvement is very good because we have here a spectral variance that is a, a very good spectral variance we also have solved the problems uh, of the resonances. So this is where, from where we have started to where we went. In conclusion, splay walls and asymmetric rear corners help improve spectral variance. The use of this concept needs a new approach of prediction technique using finite element analysis, and also the relevance of using new quantities in acoustics, which is not a new quantity, as so I thought it was, but it's not, uh, it's not in fact, but it's Eigen frequency lifetime and Eigen frequency uh, DK20 to face the long time calculation time domain analysis. All right, I'm done guys. So if you have any question? Hello, I'm getting Sam. a bunch getting of a bunch questions of in. Questions. All right, quick. Okay. All right. Yes. NG asks, Eng what is the optimal is the spectral, spectral variance? The optimal spectral variance, you have to define it with, uh, I think you have to define it uh, first um, with the dimension. Uh, sometime when I, uh, I get some constraints of uh, dimension and, and volume, uh, you you know that you, you won't be able to uh, to get a very good spectral variance. So you have to be honest with your clients, but also you have to, uh, um, to, it's to be defined with the clients also, because if you spend a lot of time, you can find probably solutions. But uh, I would say that starting from minus five to plus five, it's, 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 it's a good spectral variance, but it's not only, uh, uh, you don't have to uh, pay attention only to this quantity. There are also other quantities that are very important. Great. Sam Kevin asked, how about the stereo image and how does asymmetrical rear corners affect that? It's really interesting question. Good question. The two rooms uh, that we were just talking about are two of the rooms that image as well as any rooms I know. Um, the uh, air show mastering room uh, I saw that Anna Frick was on the chat. I don't know if she's still around, but a um, uh, great engineer and uh, uh, interesting uh, person. Uh, we would often do demos in there, and because they were set up for 5.1, there was a center channel, and people wouldn't believe that the center channel wasn't on. So I had to come over and like pull the cable and say, look, there's no center channel on. Um, they image incredibly well in general, the imaging tends to be uh, destroyed by bad phase response. And the truth is that the phase response really isn't affected as much by the asymmetric rear corners as you might think, because you're not really shifting phase, you're just moving the modes that are um, hanging on, the distribution becomes more even. So the spectral variance becomes less, meaning that the room's smoother and smoother frequency response, smoother phase response leads to better imaging. So really there's no, there's no perceived difference between left and right. 
and the image and the the depth of the image is incredibly good. You got another question there, Tyler? Um, we do have a couple other questions. Okay, SQC Acoustique asked if it's less expensive to design this way, meaning I think using a modal map, mm -hmm. uh, versus you know constructing a room and then measuring it later. Oh, designing around that. Yeah. Okay. So the question is: Is it better to design this way? rather than measuring a modal map after the initial construction. Um, the truth is, is that it's almost never practical to uh, build a room, measure it, and then make decisions about what treatment you need just because of the lead time on items. Um, you know, right now I'm begging Richard and other manufacturers, please don't make me wait 14 weeks. Uh, when people go into construction, their money is basically giving them no return. So once they design, decide on a design, there may be some small tweaking that you can do, adding a panel or two, but you really have to design the low frequency absorptive panels into the design. That's what I meant by a coherent design. And very few people are going to let you build it, measure it, and then wait while your materials get built. It just doesn't, it's just not practical. Um, there's the cost of actually doing it that way. And then there's the cost of, well, consider the base trap at Airshow Mastering or the base trap at Tonal Park. Those two rooms, the base traps are integrated into the design. So you would have untreated base traps at that point, right? If you're going to try and figure out the materials afterwards. So it's not really even possible in some cases. Uh, we use this same base trap in a recent studio that's part of the mixed class of 2022 uh, called The Woods up uh, next to Woodstock, New York. And that has another big base trap above the uh, above the uh, monitors. And we're doing it again uh, in Hollywood uh, in an underground studio uh, where we have a large base trap above the monitors. Uh, so this is becoming part of our design tool that when we have the space, we try to use it that way. Great. I think the next question would be for Christian. I know he didn't, he said he didn't really want to get too much into it, but we won't ask you to give away all your secrets, but a lot of people in the chat are wondering what programs are you using for this FEA? All right. <laughs> They're really I, curious. Uh, yeah, I understand. But uh, in fact, I've spent years to, uh, investigate uh, and uh, Sam can testimony about this. I'm asking questions uh, of a uh, real case room and do some correlations uh, with my prediction work. Uh, I work with, uh, uh, of course, as I said it, uh, FEMBM based programs, but also a lot of Excel and also uh, a lot of other programs and things that I uh, oh. uh, you know, it's like my own tool at the moment. And um, I, I tried a few months ago to uh, to make a software with this, but uh, I didn't find uh, the right person to do to help me doing this. So uh, I really hope that uh, I could go into it. But at the moment, uh, it's it's a very personal thing that I'm using. I mean, so mm -hmm. great. Yeah, thanks, Christian. Um, two more questions that I think Sam will address. Sure. Do you want to read them out or should I? I got it. <laughs> okay, we have a couple of questions, uh, some really good questions here. Um, Sam, Kevin asks, with this asymmetric uh, splayed wall, isn't it hard to predict and select treatment? Do you still use room mode calculator in dealing with asymmetric rooms? What's really interesting is that um, you know, room mode, cal room mode calculators aren't accurate, particularly accurate for rectangular rooms once you put consoles and couches and tables and chairs in them. Um, and they're not particularly accurate for splayed wall rooms. However, what you find out is that most of the modes are very similar. It's only in a specific frequency range. And Christian uh, pointed this out to me that where we're really having the effect is in the 60 to 
100 hertz range, maybe 110 hertz range, maybe even a little bit higher than maybe 70, 65, 70 hertz. And that's at a critical range because that's where so many rooms fail. That's where that chest thump is. Um, no, it's not harder for me to select treatment because our treatments are designed to address very specific issues, right? And since we're dealing with low frequencies, um, you can estimate things with a rectangular room mode by looking at what happens if I make the room the largest dimensions and the smallest dimensions and look at the distribution. But what I'm saying is that by using asymmetric rear corners, that distribution fundamentally changes. So when you measure these rooms, what you find out is that they have, in this critical path, they have a much smoother low frequency response. And that's what um, Christian's uh, calculation showed. And I, I begged him, I said, let's start with two dimensional models and see what we can see if we have a result that we can then expand into three dimensional models and try and understand in this range. And he's saying, you know, your, your corners don't have much effect below 60 Hertz and above 150 Hertz. And I'm like, that's not where they were intended to work. Um, we have low frequency base traps for those frequencies, and we have diffusion for higher frequencies. So I think we're in good shape there. Um, John Lewis asks, what measurement technique is used since you're dealing with LF? Um, uh, I don't know how many people here know me and know what I do, but um, one of the things I'm best known for is developing SMART, the acoustical measurement system. Um, I believe that multi-window transfer functions are the best way to measure frequency response of control rooms by far. And what happens in a multi-window transfer function is at high frequencies, you're only seeing the loudspeaker. And as you go down in frequency, you're seeing more of the loudspeakers interacting with themselves and the room. So in SMART, at high frequencies, the top time window at high frequencies is about a millisecond, and at low frequencies, it's about three quarters of a second. So you're really seeing the whole decay of the room in your measurement at low frequencies. And while it looks like a single measurement, it's not. It's a Frankenstein together thing that is fooling you to look like one measurement. What's cool about that is that it looks just like your ear. So... Uh, people laugh at me, but I love putting the microphone on the floor in the front corner of the room just to see the modes uh, more clearly. Eric writes, would it be easier to splay the back wall instead of having two different back corners? Splay the back wall? Yeah, I guess relative to the front wall. Splay, you mean vertically? You think he means vertically? I'm not sure what he means. Well, if you splay it back you're creating a triangular trap that's going to kick sound back out. You can make that into a bass trap, but you'd have to make it really big and really deep. Um, I, I'm not sure that I understand that. You'll have, uh, uh, Ang Boos, uh, you'll have to uh, make a, squ uh, make a uh, sketch and uh, we'll look at it. But um, in general, I don't think you can splay a back wall that much to get that kind of uh, uh, response. Um, can you clarify what you mean by outer shell? No, that's oh, me. that's you. <laughs> What's the question? The question is, could you comment on the splayed wall construction regarding the impact on room modes and perhaps the outer shell might be high mass? Yes, the outer shell is high mass. We typically use three layers of five eighth inch chipboard for our walls and ceilings. They're sitting on an isolated floor. Um, Typically, that isolated floor is a, has a high density, high mass density sandwich on top of a discontinuity layer. And if we have uh, vertical height, uh, we'll use kit pads as well. We've done concrete slabs. Uh, we've done everything we can think of to do. Um, displayed wall construction uh, impacts room modes in, in the way that Christian showed, that if you take a rectangular room, and you splay the walls, you get better spectral variance. If you add uh, cut corners that are symmetric, you get better spectral variance. And if you make them asymmetric, you get the best spectral variance, varying from about 5 dB uh, to uh, 13 or 14 dB better. 
So you're getting a tremendous improvement in the control of modes by splaying the walls and the ceiling. Um, I, I am a big fan of splayed walls and splayed ceilings. And uh, I like base traps. And I just built a room in Las Vegas. And I can say that Tyler played a big role in this. And we used asymmetric rear walls, but we did a base trap at the rear of the room because that's where we had the space for it. We didn't have any vertical height. Any other things? A question regarding, um, do you have any experience with furniture inside of the control room, such as the console affecting room modes or frequency response? Yes, um, I do. I'm actually, I'm actually just wanted to explain that the center portion of the rear walls here is parallel to the front wall. The rear corners are not. The center, the center two thirds of the rear wall are always parallel. The big diffuser is parallel to the front wall. The only thing that's asymmetric in these rooms is the uh, cut corners. There are lots and lots and lots of interesting problems that come up. One of the most interesting ones is at a studio outside of New York City when we took out the equipment racks that were in the middle of the room and the low frequency modes changed dramatically. And they had lots and lots of tall equipment racks behind the console. And when we removed them because of a flood, believe it or not, and I measured the room before they got them back, it was a better sounding room. So we came up with a better, better solution. The problem is that there are so many different types of details uh, and uh, in the different types of desks, desk sizes, tables, treatment in the front of the room, windows, no windows, that it's very hard to come up with specific rules and none of these tools are really accurate enough to start modeling that we have a hard enough time modeling the basic room shapes and getting the eigen modes yeah can you remind us how we have to eliminate Christian is addressing oh go ahead yes. christian yes Con concerning the the furniture most of the time when i when i design a room uh, i take into account the the mixing desk and also uh, uh the furniture because uh, they change the pressure distribution and I adapt, I, I use an adequate acoustic treatment to uh, correct uh, the influence of those furnitures. So they have to be taken into account in the prediction work unless you, you, you will have a, a big surprises when you will do your measurements. And here, as you can see, the, the place where, where I'm sitting, uh, it's, concave sailing and there is a desk and there are some also some other furnitures like analog tape and etc and everything has been taken into account in the prediction work so it, it's possible but it takes time this was my two cents hey okay. <laughs> let's do uh one or two more and then uh call it a day i hope you folks have all found this to be uh interesting and fun and uh worth a couple hours of your time uh i know that i feel very lucky to have met Christian and gotten started to do some work together. And we're hoping to expand this paper and uh, maybe do more of these a lot, a couple times a year, three or four times a year and show up at NAM, other shows. I think that's why, is there any last question you want to ask? There's one more question in here that yes. maybe can go to both you and Christian, but how accurate do these you know models have to be for proper FEA? Christian, you want to take yes. a shot? Yes, all right. Uh, most of the time, it's uh, very relevant. Uh, uh, I've seen um, some uh, very, very good correlations between uh, prediction work and measurements. Sometimes it's less, but uh, each time uh, there are some uh, very good. Um, they, they, the the prediction work uh, point uh, uh, the the big issues. So. Uh, when it's not perfectly correct, correlated, it allows to solve uh, the biggest issues. But for example, in that room where am I sitting here, uh, I had some very, very, very good correlation. It was uh, shivering, you know, it was just crazy to, to get that, uh, uh, that correlation. And it was like uh, minus 2 dB or plus 2 dB uh, in the frequency range between 20 Hertz and 200 Hertz. But it, it took a lot of time because I had to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, in to get the, the right data in the, in the, uh, in, uh, in the tool and it, and took in, it took a lot of time, but 
uh, most of the time, as I said, uh, this point, uh, this work point, uh, the biggest issues, and it's very, very relevant. All right. Any last questions? We can take a few more and then we can say goodbye. Philip asked, how do you get the input data for your simulation? Is that yeah. Christian? So uh, it's uh, like I said just before, uh, I spent a lot of time doing some correlation work with all uh, uh, type of acoustic treatment, membrane absorbers, helmets, uh, porous absorbers, uh, uh, complex um, uh, complex of porous and membrane, and etc. I spent months and years uh, doing some correlation work. When uh, I now, when I enter the data in in the tool, uh, I'm I'm sure that this is uh, this is accurate because I I had some correlations that shows uh, many times that these uh, data were good data for making prediction work. So this is how I do. I make some correlations between measurement uh, and uh, prediction and changing some parameters in the tool, uh, like some parameters in porous, like AFR, but also tortuosity, porosity, etc., uh, density, and for membrane absorbers also, if it's sealed, if it's not sealed, so so many parameters that I change, little by little, I, I get to uh, very relevant things in my prediction work. So this is how I do it with correlations. Perfect. I think that's pretty much it for the questions. Great. Hey, everybody. Thank you again for spending some time with us. I want to thank my good friend, Christian. Hey, Christian, you. you got a nice haircut. Yes. <laughs> like you. Um, uh, you yeah. Listen, I, I, uh, I do these because I've been lucky to have a bunch of people who have mentored me and helped me and answered my questions. And so... Uh, as I'm getting on and trying to share what I know, and um, Christian is uh, certainly pushing the boundaries of uh, measurement. Hopefully, we have a great uh, community of people who will all share ideas and uh, push us all to build better rooms. So thank you all. Have a great thank day. You. We're going to see about getting a copy of this online at some point, and we'll go from there. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. I'll speak to you later.